Hello all, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this 1-6 scale DML Panzer II ALF B kit. Work has been done to the tank's turret and the turret is now complete. A quick walk around the turret. The majority of the turret's detailing that you see here is all out of the box, only with slight modifications onto certain parts, which we will be going over in this video. Some features that the kit include include a elevating gun and mantlet, functional hatches, the turret does transverse. And the turret or the kit does give you a very simplistic turret interior, complete with the 25 millimeter cannon and the MG34. We'll be going over this later on in this video. Another thing, as of note, all the turrets welds have been added. And fasteners have been added to replace some of the molded in nubs, similar for which, like we were mentioned on an earlier video. It was brought to my attention that I had an error with the way I mounted the hooks to the tank's lower hull. Previously in my other videos, you will see that I sculpted weld beads around each of these hooks. That's actually incorrect. On the Panzer II, these hooks were held in place via two countersunk slotted screws. These screws detail were added to all of the hooks and all of the welds were removed. So, as, so make a note, if you are working on one of these Panzer II kits and you wanted to super detail it, do not put welds around these objects. Instead, use slotted screws. I had fasteners. I got them from microfasteners.com out in Jersey. And these are the slotted screws here. Right there is the item number in case you would like to order some for your build. As well as the contact phone number for Microfasteners, or you can go to microfasteners.com. As for the hex heads that I used in a previous video for the fender supports here, I used, this, I found another source to find the bolts. Rather than getting them from a hobby shop, which come in a smaller pouch and give you less, it's better to get them in bulk from microfasteners.com. You get a lot you get a lot more for less money. And again, there goes your item code there for these screws. The tank's commander's hatch has been modified from the kit original in in that the kit original was mounted to the turret via two molded in pegs that were on the hatch parts. That pegs would have held the hatch in place, but was a little bit wobbly for my taste. So what I did was I went ahead and drilled out the molded in hinges that are on the turret and the molded in hinges that are on the hatches. And I replaced them with a small pin or a nail. So now the hatch is on a, on a metal type pin hinged and is a lot more durable as well as functional. This type of design will not let the hatch pop off as the plastic hinge might allow. In addition to making the hatches functional, weld beads were added to the strip here that would lock the two hatches together, as well as a small bead was added to the flag or the signal flare hatch. The Panzer II was similar to like the M3 Lee in that the commander hatch had a small little mini hatch in it for you to either use as a pistol port, but that wouldn't be so much on this as it would on the M3, but more or less on this vehicle for you to use signal flags or even to launch a flare from the hatch. That way you don't have to expose your whole body to do so. But into the hatch casting and is non-functional and is just there for looks. To further detail the smaller hatch, I drilled out the fake hinge and put a little pin through just to give the illusion that the hatch is functional. These two sections here are actually the hatch bump stops. On the real vehicle, they would be made out of rubber, 
and are intended to prevent the, the hatch from clunking against the metal roof. Once the tank is painted, these will be painted in black. Moving on to the hatch interior. This little locking mechanism here is, is all fabricated and scratch built. The kit does not include this. It's just a simple lock mechanism like you would find on a door bolt. And its job would be to keep the hatch in the closed position so that when you're opening the hatch it doesn't flop open on you. The piece itself is just scratch built out of plastic and some wire brads as well as some pieces of aluminum and plastic rod and tube. As of one thing as of note, the tank's headrests that you see here and here are supplied with the kit, however, are not illustrated in the instructions when mounting them on. To find these pieces, they're pretty easy to find. They're just two big rec uh, big square plastic pieces that are found on one of the runners. Ironically, the part of the runner that they're found on is blacked off and that you're not supposed to use. That would be over here, over and over here on runner letter D. Another addition to the hatch that was made was I added these two little nail heads to the latch section and for the lock mechanism here on the real tank you would pull this latch and this bolt would slide open and a tank would come out which would lock your hatch to the turret and wouldn't allow someone to pop it open during combat and throw a grenade in or spray a submachine gun inside which wouldn't be very good. I added these two little uh, these two little fasteners because on the kit casting there are two holes molded into this section here and here. So rather than having to putty them up and do some body work, a simple little snip of a plier and I just glued these two little nail heads in. Another thing as of note is that where under, underneath the bump stop there's another hole that is casted into the hatch. To plug up the hole I actually used a small M3 by 6 millimeter hex bolt and the hole is actually in a really good spot because on the real tank that hex bolt would actually hold on hold that bump stop to the tank's hatch so it's kind of a happy accident that they molded in a recess over there that was just a simple little addition just a drop of glue and there were everything was firmly in place as I noted the tank does have a very basic turret interior nothing to be wowed about though the turret interior is very simplistic and is just there I guess just to get you know just to have something to look at when you open up the hatch. The kit does include the 25 millimeter gun and the MG34 which we will go over further in this video. For this build I just wanted a simple build in that I didn't want to go into super detailing the tank's interior however this model does give you a lot of leeway to modify the tank's interior in that they do give you the basic guns and the basic gun mounts. Some people have already scratch built details for this model kit and they turned out to be very nice. For the tank's main gun, the kit supplies you with the basic 20mm cannon. The cannon itself consists of the receiver, the barrel, and the barrel extension. The receiver itself is two hollow parts that are then glued together. The same also applies to the tank's gun barrel. When you glue the two kits or when you glue the two halves together, you will have a seam running down the center of both the barrel and the receiver. With a little bit of putty work and and sanding, the seams are easily removed. The best way to remove them is with a needle file and with some sandpaper. On the tank's barrel, the kit has the tank's muzzle brake molded in. The muzzle brake itself has very basic detailing and could be reworked to improve it a bit. But rather than improving it, I went ahead and I'm going to be replacing entirely with this Resin replacement muzzle from ArmorPacks.com. The ArmorPacks muzzle brake is all cast in, in this cream colored resin. It is the same length as the kit barrel and to install it I simply cut off the muzzle brake from the collar here with a scroll saw and then just insert and plug the replacement muzzle on. 
To install the armor pack's replacement muzzle onto the kit barrel, I must first remove the kit barrel from the kit gun muzzle. To do this, I will be using the lathe. You could also use a micro miter saw or even a coping saw or a scroll saw to do the same job. The reason why I'm using the lathe is because this cut here has to be very precise. It must be removed from where the barrel meets the gun muzzle collar. If you cut a little too much, it'll require, or if you cut it uneven, it will, it will require you to sand it to square off the barrel. If you sand too much off, the barrel will be too short. Or if you cut it off wrong, it'll be in an angle. When you install the, the replacement muzzle, it'll be kind of cockeyed like such. To cut off the barrel, I will be. You, it also depends on what saw you're using as well. Here's a coping saw and this here is a small micro miter saw. The coping saw will do it will also be able to cut the plastic however if you look at the two differences in saw blade thicknesses the the coping saw's blade is much thicker than the razor edge thin, uh, thinness of the back saw blade. For this type of an application the back saw blade will be the better choice. However if you do not have a small back saw as such and only have a coping saw in hand, you could use the coping saw and still have a good outcome. To start removing the barrel from the gun muzzle, first we activate the lathe. If we notice that the barrel's in in reverse, this is because you want to, whenever you use a, a lathe, you want to cut closest to the chuck. You want to cut closest to the chuck because the chuck has the most amount of stability in this type of a setup. Now, if you are a machinist, a lot of lathes have a live post where it'll, it's a ball bearing center which would go into this end here and support it so you're able to work on the opposite side of the spindle. However, for this project, for, for this application, it's really not necessary. It's, I'm just doing a simple cut. So that's why I, instead of hooking up the live rest setup, I just went ahead and inverted the barrel so that the muzzle is on the strong end of the spindle. To, to actually cut the piece now, I will turn it on. Now I'm going to be going at, low rev, at, at, a, at a medium to low speed. You want to do this because if you go too fast, the friction of the blade cutting the plastic will cause the plastic to melt. When it melts, it will plug up the little fine teeth on the saw blade here and will give you a nice sloppy cut. Instead of a nice crisp clean cut is what we're looking for. The sloppy cut will require more sanding which negates the whole point of using the lathe in the first place. All right, we will now cut the muzzle from the barrel. Simply get a nice feel of where the cut's gonna be. And I just put on a light pressure. Slowly but surely, the and there we have it. The muzzle is now separated from the from the barrel. Now the muzzle itself is not going to be discarded and is actually going to go into my spare parts box for whenever I might need an, an object that looks similar to this for another future project. And there's the new replacement muzzle mounted to the barrel. Now one thing to keep in mind is that you have two barrel wrench slits here on the bottom portion of the barrel and you want to have them line up with the center portion of the the, bar the muzzle's retaining nut, which is seen here in the center of the muzzle. And here's the gun, the main gun that is, that's fully painted and weathered, and it's mounted to the gun mount that would be attached to the mantlet. Now normally I don't like mounting in the gun before the tank is painted, specifically smaller ordnance like this where it would be black or parkerized but the way the kit is designed you kind of have to do that but it's not too much of an issue because I will be thoroughly protecting the barrel with paper and masking tape which should prevent any overspray from occurring. The gun mount itself actually the whole turret interior itself looks like that DML was actually planning to put more parts and details inside of the tank's turret however probably for budget or time reasons they didn't uh, and they pretty much left it very bare bones like you see here here's a half moon where something would definitely would have plugged onto that 